With thoracic malignancies, we can categorize the malignancy by its physical site, either within the lung or outside of a lung. Examples of sites outside of a lung include lymph nodes, bone, or esophagus, just to name a few. We can also categorize the malignancy according to its organ of origin, either cancer originating from the lung or cancer originating from another organ, like breast, colon, or kidney, for example. We generally refer to malignancies that originate from the lung and are located in the lung as lung cancer or primary lung cancer, while malignancies that arise from a different organ, let's say the breast, for example, are named and treated by the organ of origin. So breast cancer cells in the lung are generally not referred to as lung cancer, but metastatic breast cancer to the lung. Likewise, when cancer of lung origin spreads to another organ, for example, the liver, uh, we don't generally refer to those as liver cancer, but rather metastatic lung cancer to the liver. For this talk, we'll be spending most of the time talking about lung cancer and a small amount of the time talking about metastatic cancer to lung. Let's talk about a more formal classification of cancer in lung. Cancers in the lung are divided between primary lung cancer and metastatic cancer to lung. And traditionally, most primary lung cancers are classified as either non-small cell lung cancer or small cell lung cancer. The three leading types of non-small cell lung cancers are squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, and large cell carcinoma. And lung adenocarcinomas can be further divided into invasive adenocarcinoma and minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. There are also a small number of non-small cell lung cancers that don't fit the definition of squamous cell, adenocarcinoma, or large cell carcinoma. Now, not every lung cancer is non-small cell or small cell. On occasion, we may encounter lymphomas of lung origin and other cancers that don't fall under the classification of non-small cell or small cell lung cancer. Uh, things like carcinoid tumors and salivary gland tumors. Now, when we're reading pathology reports, Pathologists um, may often go into even more detail. For example, not only may an adenocarcinoma be described as invasive, um, it might be described as lipidic, mucinous, or papillary, for example. Some minimally invasive adenocarcinomas may des be described as adenocarcinoma in situ, and you may encounter mixed types like adenosquamous carcinomas, for example. Small cell lung cancers may be described in more detail. Um, as may salivary gland tumors and sarcomatoid tumors too. While this is the traditional way of classifying lung cancer, the WHO has rearranged the classification a bit, not counting precursor glandular lesions like atypical adenomatous hyperplasia and adenocarcinoma in situ, or precursor squamous lesions like squamous cell carcinoma in situ and squamous dysplasia. The WHO doesn't use the non-small cell grouping and treats adenosquamous carcinomas as its own group. Um, small cell lung cancers fall under a category named neuroendocrine carcinoma, while carcinoid tumors fall under a category named neuroendocrine tumors. With a final category named other epithelial tumors, we arrive at the 2021 WHO classification of primary lung cancer. Admittedly, I still find it a little bit more convenient to conceptualize primary lung cancers the old fashioned way, and the hierarchy is even simpler if we focus on malignancies we are most likely to encounter in normal practice. And this is a scheme I find much easier to mentally handle. Now let's talk about these guys. 95% of primary lung cancers can be classified as either non-small cell carcinoma or small cell carcinoma. And non-small cells outnumber small cells considerably. 80% of all primary lung cancers are non-small cell lung cancers, and half of non-small cell lung cancers are adenocarcinomas. The other half of non-small cell lung cancers are mostly squamous cell carcinomas. The division of invasive versus minimally invasive adenocarcinomas look like this, with invasive adenocarcinomas outnumbering minimally invasive adenocarcinomas four to one. Anyone who's a lumper and not a splitter may ask, why do we break down primary lung cancers into so many different buckets? Well, this bucket is important to everyone involved, from the family medicine doctor working in the countryside to the oncologist at a major academic hospital to the patient and their family. While 
overall five-year survivals for non-small cell lung cancers hover around 20% or so. Five-year survival rates for small cell lung cancers are much different, um, a third of that at around 6%. Survival rates for small cell lung cancers are very low because they tend to be very aggressive tumors that can grow rapidly. Two thirds are already at an extensive stage by the time they're first diagnosed. Overall five-year survival of non-small lung cancers are around 21%, but survival rates vary widely depending on which kind of non-small um, cancer a patient has. On one extreme, five-year survival rates for minimally invasive adenocarcinomas can range from 20% to as high as almost 100%, while five-year survival rates for large cell carcinomas are not much better than what we see for small cell lung cancers because minimally invasive adenocarcinomas just tend to grow very slowly and metastasize infrequently, while large cell carcinomas grow quickly and are usually not detected until they've already metastasized. So knowing which bucket your patient's lung cancer is in can have an important impact on establishing what their prognosis may be. Knowing which bucket your patient's lung cancer is in will also inform the treatment options that are most likely on the table for them. With small cell lung carcinomas, surgical cures are usually not an option and patients are usually looking at chemotherapy and radiation. On the other hand, Surgical cures usually are a possible choice for minimally invasive adenocarcinomas because they grow slowly. In fact, ther um, therapies like radiation and chemotherapy may not be highly efficacious for minimally invasive adenocarcinomas. For other types of non-small um, lung carcinomas, surgical cures are typically only possible in cases where the lung cancer happened to have been discovered at an early stage. Demographics vary between primary lung cancer types. Small cell carcinoma, large cell carcinoma, and squamous carcinomas tend to occur more frequently in men, while adenocarcinomas may occur more frequently in women. While it's unusual to encounter small cell carcinoma, large cell carcinoma, and squamous carcinoma in your younger patients, adenocarcinomas can occasionally occur in younger people. And while it's uncommon for never smokers to develop small cell carcinomas, large cell carcinomas, and squamous carcinomas, adenocarcinomas can sometimes occur in your never smokers. And here's a visual illustration of the strength of that link between smoking and the different primary lung cancer types. This is the pie chart showing the distribution of lung cancer types from earlier. Smokers account for almost the entirety of the wedges that correspond to large cell carcinoma, small cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. However, Smokers only account for about two-thirds of the adenocarcinoma wedge. As a consequence, smoking appears to be responsible for something in the vicinity of 80% of all primary lung cancers, while the remainder of lung cancers are probably attributable to other factors, including things like pollution, radon, asbestos, and other materials on this list. Switching gears a little, sometimes primary lung cancers release hormones and or substances into the bloodstream that can trigger an abnormal immune response and manifest in non-lung related symptoms elsewhere in the body. We refer to this phenomenon as a perineoplastic syndrome and perineoplastic syndromes can sometimes be the earliest sign to a primary care doc that a primary lung cancer may be lurking undiscovered. There are six lung cancer related perineoplastic syndromes I think it's good to be familiar with. Hypercalcemia of malignancy caused by abnormal production of parathyroid hormone by a primary lung cancer, which can result in symptoms such as bone pain, polyuria, and polydipsia. Syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion caused by abnormal production of antidiuretic hormone by a primary lung cancer and can result in symptoms like altered mental status or confusion. Ectopic Cushing syndrome caused by abnormal production of ACTH by a primary lung cancer and can result in a panoply of symptoms caused by high levels of cortisol in the body. Lambert-Eaton syndrome caused by an autoimmune disorder occurring at neuromuscular junctions and can result in progressive proximal extremity weakness. Hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, which can result in periostitis and joint inflammation. And carcinoid syndrome, which can, sim which can cause symptoms like diarrhea, flushing, bronchoconstriction, and abdominal pain. 
because different types of lung cancers may have associations with the presence of and sometimes different perineoplastic syndromes, a primary care doc who notices symptoms that seem like one of these syndromes may be triggered to do a more in-depth search for lung cancer and possibly catch one much earlier than if the lung cancer manifested by structural changes in the lung or more severe systemic changes like weight loss. Now, let's do a brief dive into the histopathology of the different types of lung cancer. And we'll start with squamous cell carcinomas. If you look at the lining of the central airways, you'll find ciliated cells within the airway lining responsible for the mucociliary escalator that clears inhaled particles and pathogens out of a lung. You'll find club cells responsible for detoxifying harmful substances we inhale. You'll find neuroendocrine cells that serve as sensors and signaling devices for different conditions, for example, hypoxia. And you'll find basal cells, which are progenitor cells for different epithelial cell types. In some individuals, these basal cells may undergo squamous cell metaplasia, which in some cases can evolve eventually into squamous cell carcinoma. Since basal cells are predominantly in the central airways, squamous cell carcinomas tend to also be relatively central in their distribution when they occur. Since squamous cell carcinomas tend to be more central in location, earlier symptoms such as hemoptysis can sometimes happen. Invasive adenocarcinomas tend to occur more peripherally. When you look at the peripheral airways, the lining is slightly different than what you encounter in the central airways. While ciliated cells responsible for the mucociliary escalator are present, as are club cells responsible for detoxifying substances and neuroendocrine cells for detection and signaling, we tend to encounter mucus secreting goblet cells in much greater numbers peripherally and invasive adenocarcinoma can occur when these mucus secreting cells go bad. And that's why adenocarcinomas tend to occur more peripherally as opposed to squamous cell carcinomas. What's uh, interesting is that after cigarette filters were introduced back in the 1950s, the distribution of lung cancers we saw in smokers began to shift away from squamous cell carcinoma towards adenocarcinoma. And many folks believe that it's because the particles smokers inhale through filtered cigarettes are on average much finer than particles from unfiltered cigarettes, and that these finer particles can travel much, much more peripherally in the airways. Minimally invasive adenocarcinomas tend to be peripherally occurring too. While you may encounter goblet cells and club cells in the alveolar ducts, the alveolar sacs consist primarily of type 1 pneumocytes, capillaries, and type 2 pneumocytes responsible for producing surfactant. Minimally invasive adenocarcinomas tend to be very peripheral in distribution since they often arise when these type two pneumocytes go bad. Large cell carcinomas have traditionally been described as um, or are diagnosed in both central and peripheral locations, which is kind of interesting since with the advent of more precise diagnostics, many, lung cell, uh, many large cell carcinomas are now being reclassified as squamous cell carcinomas or adenocarcinomas. Carcinoid tumors may occur both centrally and peripherally since the neuroendocrine cells from which they may arise can be found in the lining of both central airways and more peripheral airways too. A few takeaways about carcinoid tumors before we move on. Um, they generally aren't associated with smoking. Uh, folks um, sometimes also divide carcinoid tumors into typical and atypical buckets um, with typical um, carcinoids being more common exhibiting less aggressive behavior while atypical carcinoids uh, grow more rapidly. Like carcinoid tumors, small cell lung cancers also arise from neuroendocrine cells, particularly peribronchial neuroendocrine cells, which explain their strong predilection of presenting very centrally in location. A basic appreciation of the histopathology of lung cancer can go a long ways in helping us predict, understand, and remember the imaging characteristics of primary lung cancers. Different types of lung cancers arrive from different cell types, and these cell types are not distributed uniformly. Basal cells that give rise to squamous cell carcinomas predominate in the central airways, while mucous cells that give rise to invasive adenocarcinomas predominate in the peripheral airways. And type 2 pneumocytes that give rise to minimally invasive adenocarcinomas are found in the alveolar sacs. 
neuroendocrine cells that give rise to bronchial and peripheral carcinoid tumors may be found in the central or peripheral airways, while neuroendocrine cells that give rise to small cell lung carcinomas are situated in a peribronchial and therefore very central location. These, um, this histopathology um, at the cellular level directly influences macroscopic observations we radiologists make on chest radiography and chest CT. That's why squamous cell carcinomas usually present on chest radiography as central masses near hyla, central masses that may obstruct lobar bronchi and cause obstructive lobar atelectasis in some patients. Compared to adenocarcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas are more likely to centrally necrose as they may grow somewhat more rapidly and outpace their vascular supply. When they do necrose, you might sometimes see an air fluid level within the mass on a chest x-ray. CT imaging features of squamous, car squamous cell carcinomas mimic the same features we just described for chest radiographs, including post-obstructive pneumonia. Now let's look at a few squamous cell carcinoma examples. Here's a case of squamous cell carcinoma presenting with obstructive left upper lobar atelectasis and slight bulging of that left major fissure medially. Abrupt occlusion of the left upper lobe bronchus on CT and an FDG avid central lung mass with a region of central necrosis. Here's another case of squamous cell carcinoma which appears to be invading the lumen of the right pulmonary artery on this enhanced chest CT image and causing a lot of consolidation, a lot of opacification peripherally, which may represent a combination of post-obstructive pneumonia and atelectasis. Invasive adenocarcinomas tend to be slower growing and more peripheral than squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, they may present as a nodule surrounded by a region of air-filled lung though they can also present as a mass if given the chance to grow silently. Less common mucinous or lipidic adenocarcinomas may even appear consolidative, sometimes resembling pneumonia. Invasive adenocarcinomas can metastasize relatively early. Here are a couple examples of invasive adenocarcinomas. And here's a case where the primary adenocarcinoma was between one and two centimeters in size, but had already spread centrally, resulting in bulky confluent right hilar and mediastinal lymphadenopathy, which was all very FDG avid from the primary tumor to lymphadenopathy in the right hilar, subcarinal, right paratracheal, prevascular, and lower left cervical stations. Here's another invasive adenocarcinoma in the right upper lobe, and here's an invasive adenocarcinoma in the left lower lobe that became quite a large mass and peripheral in location. Mucinous adenocarcinomas can sometimes appear more consolidative than nodular or mass-like, mimicking a pneumonia like in this right lower lobe case, and occasionally uh, quite fluidly multifocal like in this case, where the soft tissue windows even reveal some regions of atypical calcification within the consolidative regions. Not every adenocarcinoma is peripheral, and so don't be surprised by the occasional case like this left perihilar adenocarcinoma or this adenocarcinoma presenting as an invasive central lung mass resembling what small cell carcinomas or squamous cell carcinomas um, more um, traditionally may do. Minimally invasive adenocarcinomas usually present as subsolid lung nodules on chest CT. Since the nodules are subsolid, they often may be invisible on chest radiography. Sometimes, on chest CTs even, they may be quite faint, such as in this lateral left upper lobe case. Large cell lung cancers grow quickly and are often undetected until they've already metastasized. Most often, they present as a lung mass at diagnosis and may be either central or peripheral in location. Due to their rapid growth, large cell carcinomas may necrose and cavitate centrally like squamous cell carcinomas. And here's an example of a large cell lung carcinoma presenting as a left perihilar mass. Small cell lung cancers are characteristically central location. Because they're so central, they have excellent access to the hyla and mediastinal lymphatic network, presenting them, permitting them to spread quite rapidly, resulting in metastatic masses throughout the mediastinum and hyla that often resemble the look of lymphoma. 
On chest radiography, mediastinal widening and hilar enlargement or masses are typical findings, while on CT, you may also see direct invasion of mediastinal and hilar anatomy and mass effect on structures um, such as the SVC. Here's a case of small cell lung cancer presenting as bulky multifocal solid masses within the mediastinum and hilum. Bronchial carcinoid tumors usually present as relatively central while circumscribed round masses. Due to their central location and usual, usually endobronchial location, obstructive lobar atelectasis isn't uncommon. On CT imaging, carcinoids may exhibit calcification and can avidly enhance on contrast CT. Here is an example of a bronchial carcinoid tumor presenting as a partially occlusive endobronchial mass in the bronchus intermedius. And here's another bronchial carcinoid presenting as an endobronchial mass growing within and markedly expanding the right lower lobe bronchus. This is a central right lower lobe bronchial carcinoid presenting as a right infrahilar mass on chest radiography. And here's another central right lower lobe bronchial carcinoid that's obstructed the bronchi centrally, resulting in several mucoceles more peripherally. And here's an example of a central left upper lobe carcinoid tumor that's obstructed the left upper lobe bronchus, leading to a juxtaphrenic peak on the left side, a loof sickle sign in the upper left chest, marked anterior displacement of the left major fissure due to obstructive left upper lobar atelectasis. The corresponding CT images um, also show that this central left upper lobe um, mass um, quite well, um, involving, including a small amount of eccentric calcification and tight obstructive atelectasis peripherally. Peripheral carcinoid tumors will usually present as a solitary so, um, solid lung nodule surrounded by air-filled lung parenchyma. If you look carefully, sometimes you may even recognize involvement of a subsegmental bronchus. On PET imaging, many may not be FDG avid. Here's an example of a patient with peripheral carcinoid tumor with no FDG avidity on PET imaging. Hopefully these cases um, showcase um, the different imaging tendencies of primary lung cancer types, but also how sometimes um, appearances can overlap. In the last few minutes, I'd like to talk about metastatic cancer in the lung. Here's a chart I created with primary cancer along the horizontal axis and metastasis site along the vertical axis. There's a bit of information to digest on this chart, but the main takeaways for now are that the site for primary lung cancers um, to metastasize to are usually adrenal glands, bone, brain, liver, and the lung itself, while pretty much every primary malignancy in the body can metastasize to the lung which is why chest CTs are such a common study in oncology. Of all the primaries on this chart, I'd say the top non-lung primaries that metastasize to lung are usually breast cancer, colorectal cancer, renal cell carcinoma, and head and neck cancers. Metastases to the lung may present in three different ways, as parenchymal nodules, as endobronchomets, and in a miliary or random nodular interstitial pattern. Parenchymal nodules are far and away the most common presentation of metastasis to lung. Um, they can be solitary, few or many, small to large, um, all of similar or very different size. Um, parenchymal metastases are most often solid, um, tend to be more well circumscribed and rounder compared to primary lung cancers, and um, tend to be also more peripheral location. Here's an example of a solitary colorectal cancer to the lung and an example of a solitary renal cell carcinoma metastasis to lung. In this case, in this case of a renal cell carcinoma, several parenchymal nodules are present are, and are of different size. In this case of lung adenocarcinoma metastatic to lung, the nodules are smaller and more numerous. Uh, while in this case of thyroid cancer to the lung, the nodules are of similar size and innumerable. And in this case of metastatic breast cancer to lung, the nodules are also very many, but larger. While parenchymal metastases are typically non-calcified, in the setting of a small number of cancers, 
For example, osteosarcoma, uh, the metastasis may be um, completely or partially calcified. And the bronchial metastases are a more uncommon presentation of metastasis to lung. Most common sources um, are usually colorectal cancer, renal cell carcinoma, melanoma, lymphoma, and lung cancer. In this case of melanoma metastatic to lung, the lung metastasis represents a mucus plug in the posterior left lung. But unlike a mucus plug, its um, margins aren't quite as straight as uh, on, numeral, on normal mucus plug, and its morphology appears a little bit more nodular or lobulated. While in this case of lymphoma, um, we have a metastasis that's actually endotracheal and might have been mistaken for a mucus blob. Miliary pattern metastases are another rare presentation of metastasis to lung. Most common sources are renal cell carcinoma, melanoma, choriocarcinoma, thyroid carcinoma, and osteosarcoma. And the pattern resembles the diffuse random nodular interstitial pattern we customarily think of in diseases such as miliary TB. Now let's summarize our take home points. Primary lung cancer is not one uniform disease. Different types exist and are classified by what type of lung cells went bad. And each type may have its own imaging predispositions, treatment, and prognoses. Likewise, metastatic cancer to lung is not one uniform disease. They may come from primary cancers of practically any organ in the body, present in slightly different ways, require different treatments, and come with different prognoses. Location and distribution of malignancy in lung can give us a preliminary hint as to diagnosis, but ultimately the diagnostic process is a multidisciplinary task that involves a large team of people, including radiologists, pulmonologists, surgeons, and pathologists.